So good evening. It's great to have everyone here tonight. I'm really glad so many people have come out, and I hope even more people uh, emerge from dorms and other places over the next few minutes to hear this, uh, this talk tonight. Uh, it's terrific that Jack and his colleagues have put together this set of symposia on decoding science. I can't think of a better topic for all of us to be thinking about these days as we think about issues uh, all the way from uh, cancer to climate change. Uh, it becomes even more important every day, I think, that we find ways to communicate as scientists with the general public and the general public with us as scientists. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I uh, arrived here uh, from Penn State, as Jack said, uh, as part of that wave of people moving westward uh, about seven months ago. And uh, I've been delighted in the time that I've been here, and I'm very delighted that I'll have an even uh, closer role to play now with uh, the Mizzou campus. I think that's just terrific. Um, I am a scientist, uh, trained in chemistry, spent my career in chemical engineering, and have thoroughly enjoyed it. I have enjoyed uh, teaching and teaching graduate students as well as undergrads for all that time, and interacting where I could uh, with the public as frequently as I could. And we had some pretty notorious people who did some excellent work along those lines at Penn State, people like Michael Mann and others who worked very hard uh, to express their points of view. So science, and maybe science combined with business, is really uh, how the world goes round. And I think it's symposiums like this at MU uh, that as they make science a little bit more understandable, for some of you who are not scientists, I hope it makes it a little more enjoyable, uh, maybe even a little cool. Uh, tonight's speaker hopefully is very cool, and I've met him, and I think he is. Uh, but one of the problems we, we face is creating that dialogue between science and the public. And, in a large part, that's caused, I think, um, certainly not necessarily by the public, uh, but really by us as scientists in, in not finding ways to express ourselves effectively and to really be able to explain that which we do uh, to people who don't have the depth of knowledge in a particular area that those of us who practice in those areas do have. So I'm really pleased that uh, MU is working on this problem and is, uh, I think, particularly well-placed to work with it, given that we have such breadth of science, engineering, and the journalism school, which is really pretty cool. Uh, I should say something else, though, and that is I think it's really exciting to see how much entrepreneurship is going on coming out of this school and bringing in people from other schools around the campus. And I think that's exceedingly interesting also. So this event, I think, is an example of the kind of interdisciplinary collaboration that we seek to promote at Mizzou. Uh, it's a collaboration between the Bond LSC that Jack runs so expertly at the Mizzou Advantage and the colleges around campus. Uh, there are two reasons we invited James Sirwicki here tonight. First is that we could argue that economics is a science. Uh, some might not agree. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, but he communicates about it very effectively, given that he's a historian. Uh, I think that's kind of interesting. And more to the point, he translates these complex subjects in a way that I think all of us who take a look at The New Yorker uh, really appreciate every week. And uh, he's been expert in that. His book, The Wisdom of Crowds, which I know many of you have looked at, uh, really does challenge the stereotypic idea of genius and uh, the sole people working alone. And, and I think that goes along very much with the ethic that we have here also in interdisciplinarity. Uh, he seems to have a dip, depth of understanding of collective wisdom, if you will, uh, that is really quite remarkable and uh, obviously is pointed to ways in which under the proper conditions that kind of wisdom can re really lead to truly outstanding results. So I think what he will share with you tonight will be very insightful. And I hope it will be beneficial to all of you, and especially uh, to those of you who are still students finding your path forward. So if you would join me, please, let's give James Sirwicki a, a really wonderful Mizzou welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so. Uh, when I was asked to, to do this, to come talk about um, decoding science, I was a little taken aback in the sense that um, what, I, what I write about is really social sciences. 
um, rather than hard science. And, and as you know, some people think of that social science is to real science as you know, military music is to music, basically. So uh, that, it, that it, it just doesn't have that, the status. And, uh, and, and certainly when I think about people, including colleagues of mine, who spend most of their time writing about the hard sciences in, in some form or another, um, I have uh, tremendous respect for the challenges they face in being able to find ways to make that material really engaging. I think you know, people who can do it well, um, it, it, it's really an exceptionally uh, impressive feat and I think also an in, incredibly important feat because obviously um, science is really central I think to both where we are today and, and more importantly probably to where we're going in, in the future. At the same time I think writing about social science um, while there are certain benefits of it when you can compare it to say traditional hard sciences it's, it's easier probably to engage people um, because you're writing about stuff that often in some ways uh, people can connect to and a lot of times there are uh, interesting stories many of which I will try to tell you tonight um, that you can relay. Uh, there are also I think challenges in writing about social science that are uh, probably in some ways unique to, to that to that task. Um, unlike the hard sciences and this is sort of obvious the social sciences are trying to diagnose systems that are in a sense kind of in perpetual flux. They're always changing. So if a I'm going to say something that I'm sure is probably not true, but uh, you know, if a, if a quark is the same today as it was uh, three centuries ago, human beings are not. Human beings are not in that sense like molecules. Um, they do not behave the same um, under the same circumstances. Um, and human beings affect each other. They change in response to each other. They often do things that are unexpected. Um, they shape their own behavior, they shape the behavior of their cultures in ways that are oftentimes interesting and revelatory, but that also make it difficult sometimes to say universal things about them. So there is a complexity, I think, to writing about social science, at least if you want to write about it as honestly as you can, um, that you really have to reckon with, I think, as a, as, a, as a writer. And the social sciences, and in this they're not really different, I think, from other sciences, also, obviously, you have to wrestle with the problem of jargon. And that's a problem that I deal with on a couple of different levels. So um, one of the things I do in my column is I write about the business world in general. That's, I'm a business columnist. I write about events that are taking place um, in the business world or in the macroeconomic world. So the column I wrote last week was about Candy Crush Saga. And the column I'm writing this week is a column about uh, sort of applying in very loose, very loose terms uh, game theory to thinking about what's happening in Ukraine and the way Russia is using its natural gas supplies as in an attempt to sort of leverage its power in that region. So that's a pretty wide spectrum of, of subject matter. Um, and in writing about business though, uh, obviously you have to deal with the question of jargon. There are, uh, on a very simple level, there's a kind of language that uh, business people and certainly finance people use that's not necessarily immediately accessible to lay people. Um, I mean, I do think lay people, ordinary readers, are, are more familiar, more at home with business language today than they probably were 20 years ago. But I think it still remains, and this is especially true when it comes to, say, finance. So when you think about the financial crisis of, um, of 2008 and 2009, that a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the language, the jargon, that um, the the issues in that crisis were embedded in are just very hard for people to understand. And they should be, because there's no reason for people to spend a lot of time studying them. So I think one of the challenges is obviously finding ways to make that language, to make those subjects, which are relatively arcane, uh, somewhat accessible. And, and I deal with the same issue when it comes to the social sciences. So one of the things I also do in my column, oftentimes, is I'll try to apply insights from um, work in behavioral economics or psychology or sociology and take that and import it and you know ideally use it in a way that sort of sheds new light on something that's in the news or a business story that people have been talking about or the like and the hope is that doing so really provides both a new angle on whatever it is you're reading about in the news but also that it maybe will help you understand in a kind of more concrete way exactly what social scientists are doing and, and what they're talking about. And there too, I think, you have to wrestle with the question of jargon, the question of, of language that maybe doesn't seem immediately intuitive. 
And I'll talk a little bit later about uh, the, the specifics of that. I think there are some circumstances where the work that social scientists are doing is just, in a way, kind of almost impervious to language. It's just very hard to talk about in words. Uh, it's almost designed to be represented in diagrams. And so finding ways to talk about it in words is, is sometimes, I think, I think, kind of challenging. But I have to say that I think the rewards of it are actually uh, enormous. So when you can actually make these subjects understandable and accessible, and perhaps most importantly, really, as a writer, I guess, engaging, um, and when it feels as if you're actually able to illuminate something, um, that is actually an incredibly sort of satisfying, and I think you hope that's a big part of what you're trying to do as a writer. Now, I'll just talk a little bit about my own background, because I think it's actually relevant to the question of how you go about trying to decode science. So um, it, as you mentioned, I actually am a historian by training. Well, I shouldn't quite say that. I was a graduate student in history for a very, very, very long time uh, without ever actually getting my PhD. So I, uh, I really enjoyed graduate school. It was, it was great. Um, but um, but I, in the mid-1990s, I left graduate school and I started writing for a website called The Motley Fool, which some of you have probably heard of. So they, it's a, a site that, that was started by a, f a friend of mine who I'd gone to college with and his brother. And it's a site that's sort of designed to sort of teach people how to invest. And when I first started working for The Fool, I was actually working in, in subject matter that was very close to home. So I was, I was running a site for them that was about culture and politics. Um, I sort of you know, think of it in retrospect as kind of a mix between like the New Republic and Spin or something. It's a sort of weird concatenation of, of subject matter. But, um, but that site folded very quickly. And uh, soon after that, and, and what I did basically was just move over and start writing about business and investing for The Fool. I had spent a lot of time with these guys. Um, it was only about a year, but I had spent a lot of time with them talking about these subjects. Um, the, the subject matter sort of fascinated me. Um, one of the things that I think is really engaging uh, for someone who has a certain kind of personality, and I'm one of them, about the business world, um, to me it's much like the sports world. That is to say that there's a kind of self-enclosed quality to it. It has a sort of internal logic. Um, in, in, on its own terms. And it's very interesting to look at that as a writer and try to interrogate it. Because one of the things you can actually do is see the places where uh, people in that world are making all kinds of assumptions that may not be justified or they may be missing certain kinds of things. And you know, some of you are probably familiar with um, the book Moneyball, Michael Lewis's book about Billy Bean, who was the general manager of the Oakland A's and who kind of revolutionized in a lot of ways, the way baseball teams um, sort of think about talent and talent evaluation and how they build teams. And, and that process, that process of sort of looking at the underlying assumptions and, and trying to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't is very, in, is very interesting, to me at least. And, and the business world and, and the finance worlds work really well as subjects um, in that regard. But one of the things I would say is I think it probably has helped me as a writer, because the, the fact that I came to this subject from outside has probably been useful. Because in a lot of ways, especially early on, what I was doing was actually making sense of this stuff for myself uh, as much as for readers. And so I really had to sort of think hard about why does this really work? Why does this kind of make sense? And in, 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 in that sense, I think as opposed to someone maybe who had kind of grown up uh, in the subject or had spent a lot of time studying it within academia, I think that actually it probably was a little easier for me to try to think about how you can communicate it um, to ordinary readers, to people who maybe are not that interested in the subject to begin with. And I think one of the challenges for me as a New Yorker writer in particular, and it's really been this way for most of my career after I left The Fool, is, is that you know, I think most um, New Yorker readers don't really care that much about business. Um, they're sort of interested in it, and I think they probably think they should be interested in it on some level. Um, but on a deep level, it's not something that they spend a lot of time uh, thinking about or worrying about. They're not people who necessarily are spending a great deal of time sort of reading the FT or, or, the, Wall, or the Wall Street Journal. And so one of the tasks is really to try to write about this material in a sense that, uh, in a way that actually gets people to, to care about it or to connect with it on, on some level. And I do think it helps 
to have come to it from a slightly outside perspective. Now, I've been writing about business now for 18 or 19 years, so it's a little hard for me to think of myself, myself as, as sort of an outsider, but um, I still think in some ways I do have a little bit of, of that perspective. And I also think, in a somewhat peculiar way maybe, the fact that I came to business writing um, from a graduate school background, a background that was actually pretty heavily invested in theory, has actually also helped as well. One of the things that I've always been really interested in is sort of structures um, and thinking about society or organizations in a kind of structural way. And uh, that sometimes hurts, I think, uh, when, uh, when I'm trying to write about individuals, but I think it also helps me think about systems in a way that um, can oftentimes be really, be really useful. Uh, on a, you know, very simple level, what I do is I, I have to write about these subjects in a really succinct, tight way, because I write about 950 words in my column. So it's, it's a challenge to take really complex issues and try to distill them down, um, and to do so in an honest and really fair way. I think that's really important, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but it, I think it sometimes helps if you, you're able to have a, a kind of systems perspective. Uh, and it, it maybe helps to get kind of a, allows you to take that big picture perspective that, that actually works pretty well um, in a 950 word column. Now, there are, I think, kind of tricks or keys um, that, that can help in writing about these kinds of matters and in decoding science. One of the most obvious ones, and, and one that uh, I think all of us who do this kind of rely on, is, is the story. So sometimes you just run across stories um, that seem to crystallize in a really powerful way the ideas that you're trying to write about. Um, sometimes you run across experiments, studies, that appear to have been just perfectly designed, either intentionally or sometimes by chance. Um, to really get across to readers uh, in a really memorable way exactly what uh, you're trying to convey. And I think one of the challenges is that you really want to try to, you have to be able to recognize those stories when you come in them, across them, and you have to also be able to tell them in a reasonably good and engaging way. So I'll give you a couple of examples from my, from my own work. Um, the favorite story, in, my favorite story in, in the book, The Wisdom of Crowds, is a story that actually, at the moment, feels strangely relevant. It's, a, it's the story of a, of a search for a lost submarine in 1968. So in May of 1968, a, a U.S. submarine, the Scorpion, disappeared in the North Atlantic Ocean. And the Scorpion had made a last radio transmission and then vanished. And the Navy didn't know as a result, in what direction it had been traveling. It didn't uh, know how fast it was going. It really had only a few scraps of data. It really didn't have much information to go on. And so when it went out to look for the submarine, it started out with a search area that was just immense and had no luck in finding the submarine. And then finally, a guy named John Craven came forward. He was a Navy man. And he had a somewhat eccentric idea for how to find the submarine. It was actually an idea that was based on uh, research work that had been done on horse racing, so betting at the racetrack, which I will refer to more than once, actually, in, in the next few minutes. So um, what Craven did was he assembled a group of, of, of experts, but it was a diverse group of experts. So while it included Navy men and submariners, it also included like salvage men, and it also included mathematicians. And what he did was instead of sort of locking them in a room and having them talk amongst themselves, instead what he did was in consultation with them, he came up with a series of scenarios. So things that might have happened to the submarine. A Russian sub might have hit it, a torpedo might have gone off in the tube, and so on. And then what he did was he asked each of them individually to bet on how likely they thought each of these outcomes was. And then he asked them to bet on things like how fast they thought the submarine would have been traveling, uh, what, direction it would have been tra uh, what direction it would have been traveling in, uh, what the angle of its descent was to the ocean floor, and so on. When he was finished with this, what he did was he took all of the bets and he ran them through uh, a for mathematical formula called Bayes' theorem, which is a way of quantifying the effect of new information on an old guess. And when he was finished with this process, what he ended up with was a map of the ocean floor. And on this map, there was one spot where Craven's men said, this is where we think the submarine is most likely to be. 
Now, this was not a spot that was anywhere near where the Navy had been looking. And it was also not a spot, and this is important, it was not a spot that any one member of the team had come up with. Instead, it was really a, an estimate that was the product of the collective judgment. So it was really a collective estimate. And it was also a brilliant estimate. Because a few months after the Scorpion disappeared, a Navy ship found it. And it was 220 yards from where the team had said it would be. Now, obviously, no one member of that team really knew what had happened to the submariner, how fast it had been traveling, how steeply it had fallen to the ocean floor. But, but even though no one member of the team knew any of those things, you could say, and I will say, that the team as a whole knew them all. So that's the story. And uh, for me, it kind of really embodies the concept of the wisdom of crowds, which is the subject of my book. It really embodies this idea that if you take a diverse group of people and you allow them to make relatively independent judgments, when you aggregate those judgments, you oftentimes end up with extraordinarily good results. And the first time I read that story, I mean, I'd written, st written uh, the book, obviously, and, and the first time I did a reading of that story, it sounds odd, but I read the first, the first chapter of the book, and, and I literally got a little chill up the back of my neck um, because there is something about it that's, that just is kind of eerie, I think. And, and so when the, that, I came across that story, it just seemed like that's really a good crystallization work. It really embodies the ideas, etc. Now, the point is not simply, obviously, to tell the stories. The, the idea is to actually inform them with the science with the work that's, that's built into it. But when you were able to find those kinds of stories and tell them well, I think, not to pat myself on the back, but when you're able to tell them well, I think what it does for people is really provide a kind of hook that's really enormously useful. And I have to say the same thing is true of myself, that when you have that story in your mind, it actually helps focus the ideas in a way um, that just simply sort of uh, writing about them in, in abstract terms does not necessarily always do. Now, another way you can do this, and this is similar, is obviously looking at social science experiments. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things you often find if you read the work of people who do a lot of writing about social science in one form or another, Malcolm Gladwell, other people like that, um, my own work, is you'll often see a kind of, there are many experiments people will write about that come from the 1940s and 1950s. Um, and, and into the 1960s. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that that really is in some ways a kind of golden age of these social science experiments. People were just incredibly good at designing sort of different kinds of experiments. Now, one of the thing, reasons they were very good at it was they were able to do things that nowadays you would never be able to get past the communities. <laughs> uh, they were able to sort of torment their subjects in ways that is simply no longer allowed. Um, but even the experiments that don't necessarily strictly torment the subject are nonetheless incredibly revelatory, or feel incredibly revelatory, at, at least to us, I think. Um, and there is a sort of cleanness to a lot of that work um, that, that is just incredibly uh, winning, I think, and, and that often, and it really allows people to connect with it. So, you know, some of the experiments are very bleak. The most famous one, obviously, is, is, is Solomon Ash's experiment with um, with the, the uh, electricity and, and basically getting people to think they were electrocuting people uh, for um, performing badly on a test. Um, and, and that obviously, there are all sorts, of, I'm sorry, that's not Ash, that's Stanley Milgram, but there's obviously all these sort of you know, grim results that, that come out of it. But, but you know, there are a whole host of these experiments, many of which I talk about. I mean, one of the ones I talk about in my book, which is sort of about the ways in which the wisdom of crowds can break down. Is, is an experiment that Solomon Ash designed in the 1950s that some of you probably are familiar with from your Sociology 10 classes. And the way that experiment worked was Ash brought eight people into a room and he asked them one after another a, a pretty simple question. What he had was he had, he had 20 sets of cards, uh, 20 sets of, of, of pairs of cards. And each pair had three lines on it. Of one, one card had three lines on it of varying lengths and the other card had one line on it. And the question was, which of these three lines is the same length as this line? Now, it wasn't an incredibly complicated problem. He wasn't really trying to trick them exactly. I mean, you had to look at it and concentrate maybe, but it was fairly clear most of the time what the right answer was. Uh, so what Ash did was he asked this, this question um, uh, four times, and uh, everyone basically picked the line that 
that was right, um, that, that was the correct line. And then he sprung the trap, I guess is what you'd call it, which is that of the eight people in the room, the first seven were Ash's confederates. And only the last person in the room was the subject, or I guess as it turned out really the victim, basically, of the experiment. Uh, because for the next, every time after that, Ash's confederates basically picked a line that didn't match. And the question was, what would the last person in the room do in this circumstance? And what he found, pretty remarkably, was that uh, three quarters of the people changed their minds or named the line that didn't match at least once. And a third of the people changed their minds a majority of the time. Uh, and when he asked them later what, you know, why, what their experience had been, I mean, he debriefed them, I assume, to let them know that they weren't insane. Um, but, uh, but, you know, some of them just said, I, I don't know, I just couldn't handle the pressure. Um, I think some of the time he, he told his people to heckle the last person in the room, basically. And so they just said, you know, I just went along with what, with what they were saying. Some of the people said, and this is actually a quite rational thing in some respects, is that they all, everyone else seemed so sure that they had the right answer that the last person just assumed they were missing something. And they figured that by going along with what the crowd was saying, they were actually going to improve their chances of being right, which actually is, is strictly speaking, probably the rational response. But some of the people really strangely said, by the end, I did think those lines matched. So that somehow the way they saw the world um, had basically been changed by what everyone else was saying. Now, that sounds really improbable, but it's a very powerful expression of just what peer pressure can do. And of how hard it can be, let's say in a small group, um, for people to actually remain independent of others when they're really, you know, sort of have conflicting opinions. And so for me, that was a really powerful illustration of the, what you have to get over to be able to access the wisdom of crowds. Because the wisdom of crowds is really about people thinking independently and then aggregating those independent, diverse judgments. Um, the way I sometimes put it is that the real paradox of the wisdom of crowds is that crowds are smartest when people are acting as much like individuals as possible. And I think the real point of that ASH experiment is that especially for, for us, we spend so much time working in teams or on committees and the like, is that it's important to really be aware that it isn't just high school students who are subject to peer pressure. It's also anybody really who's in an environment um, where a lot of people think one thing and they may think the opposite. So I think that these kinds of experiments can actually be enormously useful, both in revealing things about ourselves, but also in kind of, again, crystallizing them. And while I would say that we maybe have not recaptured the golden age of the 1950s, I do think that one of the reasons why uh, social science writing, to me, feels very vigorous and has felt very vigorous now for, for you know, 10 or 15 years is that there really has been an enorm an explosion of great work that's being done in this field. Um, and again, in the last two or three decades. So the, there really has been in economics and in finance, especially in the, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, and in, in the past decade as well, um, it, it, an enormous number of very interesting looks at how people actually act um, at, at what we usually call behavioral economics. And I think that they have really enlightened us in some ways. There are challenges in interpreting their findings, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I think that that, that work has been incredibly in, enlivening. And I think it's actually played a really key role um, in getting people to, or ordinary readers, to actually really connect um, with, with what social science is finding. Um, it's, in fact, I think one of the challenges as a writer is you have to avoid using it as a crutch. Uh, because these studies are oftentimes so easy to connect to um, that it's sometimes easy to overstate um, the conclusions you can der derive from them. And we've also seen a real explosion in what is sometimes, what's sometimes called experimental economics. So they now run a lot of experiments both in the field and in the laboratory uh, in a way that really economists for the most part did not do uh, in, uh, until, I mean really until the 1970s. Um, it kind of, uh, Economics either tended to be a very straight empirical field or it was a very theory-driven mathematical field. And experimental economics has really helped shift that and change that. And, and I think the results of that have been um, really uh, galvanizing as well. Having said all this, I think that there are some real challenges in writing about social science and that I, I'll just talk about now. Um, I, I think one of them, and, and to be honest, I. I feel it almost any time I talk about this stuff, is that one of the challenges is when things that are really clear to you and that seem really obvious to you as a writer 
uh, either, either because you've spent a lot of time on the material and you've really, really gone deep into the research, or simply because it's one of those things that just makes sense, uh, is instead completely opaque to ordinary people uh, and really doesn't make much sense to them on any kind of intuitive level. And I run, have run into this problem many times, basically, as a writer. Uh, and um, I'll give you a couple quick examples of it. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I write about bookies a lot and betting. Um, I'm very interested in betting, uh, in sports betting in particular, and in betting on sort of um, other events. There are these things called prediction markets that allow people to wager on things like um, elections and uh, geopolitical events and the like. And I'm very interested in this. And I'm very interested in it because for me, these markets represent attempts to actually harvest uh, sort of collective intelligence. Um, a, a betting market, uh, this point spread in, uh, on an NFL game actually represents, in a sense, the aggregated collective wisdom of all of the people who are betting on, on this game. Now, you may say, well, big whoop, I mean, so what? But to me, it's a really interesting example if that, if that price is accurate, if that point spread is good, it tells us something interesting about uh, what the collective wisdom of people can do and, and I think ways in which organizations can take advantage of that. So one of the first pieces I wrote for The New Yorker many, many, many years ago was about bookies. And I went and I actually interviewed the uh, bookmaker at the MGM Mirage in, in Las Vegas and you know came back and wrote a piece about it. And, um, so I don't know how many of you know this, but I will explain it to you in an attempt to be clear. Um, the way it works at Vegas is if you're betting on a football game, generally speaking, you have to wager $11 to get 10 back. Okay, so the way, the, the way a bookie's business model works ideally is what a bookie ideally wants to do is take in an equal number of bets on both sides. Okay, so uh, what he does in, in, in that sense is he basically hedges away all his risk. He basically can't lose money regardless of the outcome of the game. Now, it never works out this way perfectly, but that's the goal, at least in, in theory. And, and if you think about it, the way that works is um, uh, two people pay 11, each pay $11 to bet. They don't really pay $11, but just accept that they pay $11. And um, so the bookie takes in $22. The, the guy that wins, or the woman that wins, takes home $21, and the bookie is left with $1, right? So he's guaranteed a 4.5% profit, and he has basically run no risk. All he's done is you know, basically taken in their money and, and run the thing. So I, I wrote about this, and I was trying to explain this. Um, and I wrote about this, and this was in the piece originally. And um, one of my editors said, wait, I don't understand. Why would you bet $11 to only get $10 back? And I was like, no, it's 11 plus 10, so you get 21 back. But that was not obvious to her at all. And when I actually tried to write about it, I realized like it's actually kind of complex to write about in a way that's simple and accessible. So in the version I think that actually ended up running, I haven't gone back and looked at it, I think we might have just taken the specifics of that out um, and just talked instead about what the book he was trying to do and balancing the books and whatever, which sort of conveyed the same idea, just didn't go into the detail. But that was an example of something that was really crystal clear to me uh, in my mind that was very, very confusing uh, to an incredibly well-educated person who, who just had not really thought about this before. And one other example I'll give you is, is in The Wisdom of Crowds and is a, a part of that book that maybe should not be in there, basically, which is um, one of the things I'm very interested in and I think is very important um, as, a, as, some, as a social science writer is the way in which social norms uh, actually end up shaping people's behavior. Right? So we know that um, within organizations, within professions, uh, there are, in a sense, ways people are expected to act uh, ways people are expected to make decisions that um, oftentimes may not make purely rational sense, but that nonetheless persist for a variety of reasons. They persist um, because of what's sometimes called path dependence. That's just the way things have been done for a long period of time. Um, they may persist because they suit certain people's interests rather than others. Um, they may persist because of anxiety um, or whatever it is. But, but it's a very powerful force. and. Um, and I'm just intrigued by, by, by the effects that this can have. So one of the places you can actually see this is professional sports. Professional sports is a place where, in principle, you would think everyone only has one goal in mind, right? Winning. And so you would really assume that everyone would really be as rational as possible in the pursuit of victory. 
But what you see pretty clearly when you actually study professional sports, and this is what Michael Lewis's book, Moneyball, again, is about, is that it doesn't necessarily play out that way. That there actually are opportunities for people to come along and really deliver amazing insights that really transform uh, the way people make decisions. And it allows the people who come up with them initially to you know, be incredibly successful until everyone else catches on. Well, there's an economist at Berkeley, a guy named Paul Romer, who did a really elaborate study of professional football, showing that this was the case with the kinds of decisions professional football coaches made about the kinds of uh, play calling they made. So a classic example would be in football, you have four downs uh, to get a first down. And um, typically, if you uh, don't get a first down in three downs, the team just punts, basically. I shouldn't, I'm probably going to explain this to you since you're in Missouri, but in any case. Uh, but, um, but what Romer showed was that actually a lot of times it made a lot of sense to go for it on fourth down. That if you actually looked at the probability of making it versus the cost of failing, that the rational thing to do was actually to go for it on fourth down a lot of the time. It depended on where you were in the field and the like. Um, and he showed similar things about uh, kicking field goal, going for touchdowns versus kicking field goals and the like. Now, this work has actually, over the last few years, become very important in the NFL. NFL coaches have finally started to internalize these lessons. Bill Belichick probably pioneered it at the Patriots. But NFL coaches have really started to pioneer this. Now, this is an example, actually, of really interesting social science work that's really, really relevant, both practically, so NFL coaches are using it, and also, I think, very interesting as an illustration of the idea that even in incredibly competitive industries, uh, there are opportunities to kind of exploit informational advantages or to be smarter than everybody else. So I actually have a whole section about it in the Wisdom of Crowds, because it's actually a place where, in a sense, kind of the collective wisdom just doesn't get a chance to operate, uh, because everyone is just making decisions in a very rote sense, based on, you're supposed to kick to punt on fourth down, so that's what I do, et cetera, et cetera. But I think for a lot of readers, that section is kind of dense. And if you're not that interested in football, it probably doesn't actually convey the, the substance of the message as effectively as maybe another story would have done or as another thing. And so I think one of the challenges as a writer is, you know, Faulkner famously said you have to sort of kill your darlings, you know, the sentences you really love. I think one of the things you have to do as a writer is recognize that there are things that may feel very, uh, not just clear to you, but also really important to you, that to readers are just not really going to work. And so I think one of the challenges is finding a way to kind of get around that. And I think this is really interesting when it comes to social science, because, you know, social science, I think, has sort of two sort of reputations. But one of them, certainly, is the idea that it just tells us stuff that we already know. Right? It's the kind of duh reaction that everyone has when they read it. Um, that social science just you know, determines that, I don't know, mothers love their children, or whatever it is, basically. Um, the flip side of it is that it's telling us things that seem completely implausible and make no sense at all, and, and that are you know, an artifact of, of uh, the laboratory or whatever it is. I think for people who write about business and economics, and who come at it from a certain kind of perspective, one of the things you sometimes find is that Social science tells us things that seem really surprising to, to, to us as writers, but that to readers seem like, yes, of course, we all knew that, basically. Um, and I sometimes run into that with my, um, my girlfriend, who's a writer as well, but I'll sometimes say, can you believe that, da, 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 and she's like, everyone knew that, basically. Um, and you know, I'll exclaim in surprise at, at some violation of rationality. But having said that, I think it's still nonetheless interesting to actually frame the question sometimes in terms of if people were really rational, uh, which is what they're supposed to be from an economic perspective, um, then this is what they would be doing. And in fact, they're not. And so that should shape the way we think about how we do policy and the like. I'll give you an example. One of the things I'm very interested in is the way people manage money. Um, and I, I find this in myself as well. So people don't manage money in the way that economists think they should. Um, so for an economist, all money is basically the same. All the money you have is all the same. And you should basically treat it as all the same. Every dollar is the same. We don't, generally speaking, act this way. Um, a, simple a simple example of that is people, time, people will a lot of the times, a lot of times, um, keep money in a savings account even while they uh, keep balances on a credit card. Balances on a credit card that they are paying relatively high interest rates on. 
and, and that they could pay off at least part of by basically emptying their savings account, which you know at this point gets like 0.25% or something like that uh, on it. But a lot of people don't do that. And the reason they don't do it is that they're concerned that if they pay off the credit card, they'll just run the credit card back up again. And they'll be left then with nothing in savings and the high credit card balance. So it's a, an attempt for people to, in a sense, kind of control themselves. So I wrote a piece about this many years ago, and I was talking to George Lowenstein, who's a, a psychologist and a, a relatively famous behavioral economist. And he said to me, and he sort of has a very similar take on this, but, but I remember he said to me, from a strictly economic perspective, this is, of course, insane. And that, to me, kind of crystallized a lot of what, you know, writing about business and economics is about. It's about showing the ways in which things that seem sort of insane uh, from an economic perspective actually make quite a, a, a great deal of sense um, for the way individuals actually are. And I think that that's really important in understanding why social science can actually be useful. Now, I think one of the other challenges um, and then I'll, I'll sort of wrap up, is I think one of the other challenges you have as a writer is, and this is true not just of, of social sciences, of, it's of anything, but is trying to, to, to recognize um, how your own biases shape your receptivity to ideas. Because obviously one of the things you're trying to do is, uh, when you're writing about social science, is thinking about how plausible an idea it seems, how plausible a theory is. Um, whether or not you actually believe the research, whether or not it actually seems to really sort of pass the smell test. And I think one of the challenges you run into is recognizing that your own personal biases, your own individual personality, does shape how likely you think an idea really is. And I I'll give you a kind of concrete example of this. There's a, a guy, I won't tell you his name because of the story I'm about to tell you, but um, he's a really reasonably well-known social scientist. He's done a lot of tremendous work. Um, and and um, he does a lot of work on the way in which um, other people shape our ideas and our preferences and the choices we make. So he does a lot of work with fads and cultural products, showing how the fact that other people, um, just because other people think something is good, it actually makes you think it's good and the like. So it's actually sort of connected to this piece I wrote last week on Candy Crush Saga and the way in which fads can kind of take on a sort of a life of their own. Now, I don't deny that fads are real, but um, I also think that people actually are able, a good deal of the time, to be relatively speaking independent in their thinking. And the wisdom of crowds is really predicated on the idea that you can look again and again at a wide variety of circumstances and see people, for the most part, thinking for themselves and, and see the beneficial results of that when you aggregate the knowledge. So I was sitting in, in his office, he's a friend of mine, and I was sitting in his office years ago uh, once, and we were just talking, just kind of chatting about this stuff. And he was saying, he said, it's like, you know, when you're figuring out about, you know, what kind of clothes you should buy, I mean, I mean, I don't decide for myself, really. I just ask my female friends, what should I wear? And they kind of tell me what looks good or what doesn't. And I was like, are you crazy? Like, that just seemed like a completely crazy idea to me about that you would make decisions like that. And, and, I, and, and it struck me that, in a way, are different, very different perspectives on how we make choices, uh, on how we ourselves individually um, uh, sort of express our preferences or have our preferences determined, probably informs our different, differing perspectives on, on this sort of broader question. Now, that doesn't help answer the question of which of us is right, um, but it does, I think, make you, it should make us more cautious, in a sense, about um, finding things just incredibly congenial and therefore assuming that they are necessarily true. Now, the last thing I would say, and then I want to tell you one last story, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just take, take some questions, is that I think it's also important to think about things that may not be present in the research we're writing about. Um, so one of the familiar problems we have when we write about social science research is that a lot of it, even now, is predicated on um, experiments that are done with college students. No offense to the college students here, but you know, there's a lot of like psychology experiments, um, et, et cetera. And so there is, I think, an open question about can you derive, relatively speaking, universal conclusions from the behavior of college students in the laboratory? And I think that that's something that's really worth keeping in mind and acknowledging. I mean, I think that there are definitely places where uh, you can see that, that you know, that doesn't that, that actually can be 
overcome, that you can say actually, yes, even with that bias, this stuff still, still works. But it is probably the case that in the real world, a lot of the behavioral anom anomalies we see in the laboratory uh, go away. And that anomalies that maybe uh, exist when the incentives in, in an experiment are relatively low disappear when the incentives are kind of raised. And I think social scientists have gotten better about that in recent years. They've actually gotten better about taking experiments as much as possible into the field and trying to derive from them real conclusions about um, how actually human beings actually uh, kind, of, kind of work. Um, and the other thing I would say is that not everything we write about in social science can be quantified. So one of the subjects that I'm very interested in and, and I write about a lot in The Wisdom of Crowds is the subject of diversity and the importance of cognitive diversity to good decision making. So what we know is that groups that are more diverse, um, groups that are made up of people who are thinking about problems from different perspectives uh, and use different tools to try to solve problems are typically much smarter than groups that are homogeneous, um, than groups that are basically made up of people who are thinking about a problem from the same angle. One of the challenges in writing about diversity is figuring out exactly how to quantify it. So it's, it's hard to sort of figure out how do I actually sort of give people a score in a way on the cognitive diversity scale. And I think going forward that's going to be something that people are going to be spending more and more time working on. But what I would say is that even if we can't quantify it in, a, in, a, in as sort of concrete and as hard a way as we would like to, um, and in the way that hard scientists are much of the time, I think the subject is still important enough and useful enough to actually, um, to actually sort of be worth writing about. And that's something that, that, that I think you know, I, I'm constantly trying to do. So I was going to end um, by sort of giving you a, a series, three or four examples of, of things that I think um, social science has taught us that are really worth thinking about. But we're, on, you know, we're running out of time, and I want to take questions. So I'm just going to give you one example. And it's an example of an experiment that has been done many different times under many different circumstances. It's an experiment that's been done in the laboratory. It's been done in the field. It's an experiment that has even been backed up in some ways by research with chimpanzees. And I think it tells us something very interesting about um, human behavior. And, and I think it's a, a really good example of the ways in which um, the way human beings act doesn't always fit sort of textbook models. It's a game some of you are probably familiar with. It's a game called the ultimatum game. And um, the way the ultimatum game works is that they put two people in a room and they give them $10. Uh, they sometimes do it with much more money um, and, and the same phenomenon recurs. So what they say is, they say to one person, you are the proposer. This is actually easier to talk about than write about. But they say to one person, you are the proposer. And you can propose whatever split of that $10 you want. And then the, to the other person who is the uh, acceptor or receiver, they say, um, you can decide whether or not to accept the split. If you accept the split, then each of you walk out with whatever sum of money the proposer has proposed. If you reject it, you both get nothing. And so the question is, what would people do? Now, the rational thing to do uh, if you're an economist, is to propose, that for the proposer to say, let's say, let's say the splits have to be whole dollar amounts, they don't have to be typically, but is for the proposer to say, I'm going to take $9, you take $1, right? Because that way, I get $9, you get $1, which is better than no dollars, and we both end up ahead. But, of course, when that does happen, what happens is, and for the receiver, the logical thing to do is just say yes, because $1 is better than no dollars. But that actually doesn't happen. Instead, what happens most of the time is that any offer that is below $4 to the receiver gets rejected. So they literally walk away from real money rather than allow the other person to essentially reap his ill-gotten gains, I guess is the way you would put it. Um, and, uh, and, and what's interesting about this, well, there are many things, but one of the things that's interesting about this is that proposers seem to recognize this. Because what they do is their typical offer is close to 50%. That's the average offer. It's not that everyone does that. It's not the median offer. But, the, me but the, the mean offer is somewhere close to 50%. So there's clearly a recognition, probably because they feel the same way themselves, that, that unfair offers are going to be rejected. Now, this is sort of a fascinating example, right, of non-economic logic operating. Um, it makes little sense to walk away from free money. And in fact, they have done studies. And the 
uh, group of students uh, that are most likely to propose the unfair split and accept it are, in fact, economic students. So, uh, which itself is really interesting. We could talk about that if we wanted. But, um, but, but I actually think the ultimatum game is actually more than just an interesting experiment. I actually think what it does is it actually casts light on some of the more interesting phenomenon in sort of the business world. So let's take, for, let's take for example, strikes, labor strikes, um, or lockouts. Um, so labor strikes are obviously much less common than they used to be, but labor strikes are oftentimes uh, incredibly, um, they last a long time, they're incredibly painful for both sides, oftentimes especially painful for workers, and, and a lot of times, especially since labor unions have become weaker, um, they, are, they don't really result in any major change one way or the other. They, you don't normally get a result of a labor strike that's significantly different from what you would have expected to get if both sides just sat down and said, okay, what can we really, what can we really do here? Now, there are a lot of reasons why people go on strike or why companies lock workers out, and, and obviously it has to do with toughness and credibility and, and, all these, and all these kinds of things. But one of the things that's really interesting is it's very clear that these strikes, once started, go on longer than they might otherwise expect, than otherwise, otherwise, you might otherwise expect, because people aren't just making decisions based on what's economically rational, right? It isn't just about $1 being better than no dollars. It's actually about what constitutes fairness here? What actually is the right thing to do? And if the other side, typically meaning management, is not doing the right thing, then people are actually willing, in effect, to punish themselves in order to get to the right solution. So it isn't just about the longer I hold out, the more likely it is that the, the great result is going to be. It's going to be, it's also about basically people need to be punished for doing the wrong thing. And you can actually see this. There are other experiments that have been done where um, that involve sort of cooperation or attempts at cooperation, but that also give people the opportunity to defect, to not cooperate, um, and still reap benefits. And when they play those games and they make it clear uh, who's cooperating and who's not, people will actually pay real money to punish the non-cooperators. So they actually will be willing to hurt themselves in, in that sense. Uh, in order to sort of enforce the social norm. And I think one of the lessons to really take away from this is that social norms of fairness um, in whatever that means are actually very powerful and people are really interested and willing to give up things for themselves in order to actually enforce them. And to me, the ultimatum game really is a really good example of social science research that actually really helps inform how we should think about business, economics, and, and really society more generally. It's a very easy to remember um, game. It's a very interesting experiment. And I think in a very simple way, it tells us something really important about ourselves. And I think for me, that really is the best example of kind of be taking social science research and sort of writing about it in a way that's accessible. Um, you know, I think the phrase I sometimes think about in my mind is that you want, when you're writing about social science research and, and decoding science, I guess, to, to be as simple as you can be, but no simpler. And, and that you really want to be fair to the material. And for me, the sort of ideal piece is one that someone who knows a lot about a subject can read and, and feel like that actually is an honest representation of it. And someone who doesn't know anything about the subject can read and feel like they've learned something that sheds new light on their life. And when you can do that, you feel like you've accomplished something. So I'll leave it there. Okay, so I, I went on longer than I expected. I apologize for that. But can we still take a few questions? In 20 minutes? I'm sure, yeah, okay. I mean, uh, you know, however, whatever questions we have. Uh, well, I have the first one. Okay. What kind of odds can you give me on the St. Louis Blues for the Stanley Cup? Oh, Cup? well, uh, I think since they got Ryan Miller, the odds have to rise. I would say, um, what would what bet would I make? I would say. <laughs> Three to one, maybe, actually? I think they're very good. I think the odds are very good. I think, uh, you know, it's a big, it was a big trade for them, I think. Okay, so. Thank you. Uh, there were, you gave us a lot to think about. And for me, at least, a lot of the examples and premises that you stated have relevance for the 
a democratic process in our political system. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could comment on that with a particular attention to whether you think, given the wisdom of crowds, that we would be better off with the participatory democracy, with everybody voting on their own computer, than with the representative form of government. Uh, my answer to the second qu to, to that question is probably no, in the sense that um, I, I think there are a couple reasons why. I think one of the one of the question one of the reasons is simply that um, I, I do think that there are, are benefits to be gained from um, uh, from knowledge, and that actually there there are problems that are relatively complex, and and actually having people who um, are spending a, a good deal of time thinking. <laughs> This may be an optimistic view of what congressmen do, but having <laughs> people who are spending a good deal of time thinking about problems and analyzing them and the like, um, uh, it, it, there probably is a benefit to that. Um, in, in the sense that uh, it, the premise of the wisdom of crowds is not necessarily that you can just ask anybody any kind of question um, and arrive at a good answer. The, the crowd needs to have information that's relevant to it in order to arrive at, um, at, at a good conclusion. It, it's not actually, I don't necessarily even think that a participatory model would uh, arrive necessarily at, at, at terrible answers um, in any way. But I do think probably there's, there's some, there's some um, benefit to it. I, I, having said that, I think that um, democracy is the last chapter in my book. And it was by far the hardest chapter to write. And the reason for that was that when I think about the wisdom of crowds and this idea of wisdom, whatever that means, um, the way I really think about it is that when there's a situation where there is a right answer, um, in a, in a platonic sense, so we may not know, ever know if it was right or wrong, but in a platonic sense, there's a right answer. That in those circumstances, the collective wisdom of a diverse and independent group uh, is typically going to be better than the wisdom of a small number of people. Um, but the challenge in democracy is figuring out, is there a right answer? In other words, does such a thing as a platonic correct policy exist? And, and that's obviously a hard question to answer because people have very different ideas about what constitutes the common good. They have very different ideas about what government should be doing and, and all those things. And so I think that um, it's hard for me ultimately, to, it's just hard for me to reach a good conclusion about that. Having said that, I do think that one of the big issues obviously in any democracy and certainly in a representative democracy the size of ours, which is to say you have 535 people governing 300 million people now, right, versus what it used to be. Um, it is just accessing information and just getting at um, the real knowledge that people have um, uh, in their of their, of their of their everyday lives. And I think that one of the things I would say is I do think that that politicians and community organizers all that, that actually incorporating the insights of people, creating mechanisms that allow people to actually weigh in um, in a more systematic fashion is something that would be tremendously <laughs> beneficial. Um, I, I think you know one of the big challenges American democracy has right now is that crowds work best when there is a uh, diversity of opinion, diversity of knowledge, et cetera, but some measure of commonality of values. Um, values can just be something as simple as shared objectives. So in an or ideally in an organization, you know, in a company, you're trying to, I don't know, I guess increase profits or whatever it is. Um, uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a school, you know, you try to improve the education of your students whatever it is. Um, I think one of the challenges in thinking about American democracy today is, is whether or not, not that we necessarily ever did, but to what degree those common values have really become fractured. And, and we really have a situation in which uh, people on different sides um, really feel profoundly alienated from each other. I still have this sort of optimistic faith that underneath it all, you know, we're all Americans. But, um, but I do think that, that, that it is a little tendentious. And I think the other issue is obviously that um, the, the more divided we become, especially when it comes to, say, like the media or whatever, the easier it is for people to get locked in echo chambers um, where they're really only listening to the people they agree with. Um, it, that's a tendency we're all subject to, but I think that also makes it harder to actually arrive at good collective decisions um, because there's just much less communication, much less of a sense of, of what other people are thinking. So, sure. Yeah? Okay, so I was wondering, um, this is kind of going off of the democracy thing you were just talking about, but when does the wisdom of crowds turn into mob mentality, I guess? Yeah, so um, the, the, the sort of traditional image of, of uh, crowds is that they are extreme, 
that they're sort of given to sort of mob behavior. They oftentimes arrive at decisions that are worse than any one individual would do. And, and there are plenty of examples of those to think about. I mean, in, in history, not just mobs, but if you just think about our recent history, the stock market bubble of the late 90s or the housing bubble or whatever. Um, for me, I think the real determinant of uh, the, the thing that really turns crowds into sort of mobs or the, the real driver of the, of the madness of crowds is really a breakdown in kind of diversity and independence. So it, it's really what happens when people stop, in a sense, thinking for themselves and start actually just taking their cues from what other people are doing. Um, in financial markets, uh, I, think, I think this happens, um, sometimes it happens out of an excess of, of, of exuberance, so people become convinced that essentially there's only one sort of way to go, which is up. Um, I think in, in, uh, in panics or crashes, um, it just becomes very hard to resist uh, the fact that everyone else is running for the door. I think that is just a, there is a, clearly a, a human impulse in that. And, and I think that um, it, it's also very clear that uh, we are sort of, we exist on a spectrum. So some people are incredibly good at being independent to the point where probably they're too independent. Um, they just don't take cues from anybody else at all. Uh, at all. Some people are just sort of slavishly following what everyone else is doing. I think most people are in the middle. And w the c one consequence of that is that um, fads or mobs tend to get more powerful, and this seems maybe obvious to say, this is one of the dumb moments, I guess, but the more people that, that, that sort of follow them. And, and but the reason they become more, uh, the reason they become more powerful is that they actually start to seem more credible. So I don't think it is as simple as just saying that uh, people know they're kind of lemmings, basically. I think, I mean, that sometimes may happen in a mob situation, but, but I think in a fad or in a, in a, in a, in a uh, oftentimes in a financial bubble, what really happens is that in a sense, the fact that so many people are doing something actually changes our perception of it, that it actually ends up making it seem um, like something worth doing. And, and that isn't actually a bad thing. Well, let me put it differently. It's not necessarily an irrational way to feel. Um, because, you know, a lot of times, if a lot of people are doing something, there's a good reason for it. Um, and, you know, I'll give you an example that I, I think it's in the book. I don't know. I, it's a very homey example. I, I live in Brooklyn. And uh, I think I told, this, I told this story this afternoon to a, to, to a class. So if you're here, I'm sorry, I, I tell it again. But um, I live in Brooklyn, and you have to move your car once a week for street cleaning. And, um, but in Brooklyn, we also get a lot of uh, religious holidays. And on religious holidays, you don't have to move your car because there's no street cleaning, uh, which is awesome. So uh, anyway, but that means that on any given day, you're not really sure is, is street cleaning, are street cleaning rules in effect or not. Now, there are ways to solve this problem. You could go online or you could call 311. But what I do instead is I work at home. And what I do, you've got to move your car by, it's 1130 now, I guess. It used to be 11. They, they moved it. But by 1130, what I do is I look outside my window at like 1115. And if everyone, if all the cars are still on the street at 11.15, I basically say street cleaning rules must be suspended today. And I just go back to my work. I don't check. I, I just assume someone in that row of cars has done the necessary work <laughs> to figure out what the rules are. Now, the, but the thing that's important about this is it always works. I never get burned by this rule, basically. And, and I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons why this stuff can be so powerful is because um, it's actually really... Uh, it's easy to follow what everyone else, to follow the herd, and oftentimes it'll get you the right answer. And so I think that that's really part of the challenge is, is, is sort of counteracting that, counteracting that force. Right. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello. So uh, you talked about the blogosphere in a TED Talk you gave and oh, its yeah. effect um, on our knowledge of natural disasters. I was wondering uh, if you can give some of uh, insight on what you think the unfiltered information from our front lines of current conflicts has changed our knowledge of those conflicts. Wow, that's really interesting. Wait, what was the word you used the word before information? I, I missed that. Unfiltered. Unfiltered, oh. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, are you thinking of soldiers in particular or just any, anybody, basically? I wanted to leave it uh, open-ended, yeah. just so you can yeah. talk on topic. No, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's a great question. I, I, the, the talk he's referring to is a talk I gave at TED um, which was sort of loosely speaking about um, 
uh, the, the way blogs and I mean this was pretty early in, in, in the process. I mean it was like 2006 or something. I can't remember when it was or maybe some. Um, about the way they're sort of transforming uh, our experience of news and, and, and knowledge and, and sort of breaking down um, you know, some of the more traditional um, hierarchies. And, and uh, it was sort of pegged to the tsunami where obviously a lot of our experience from a news perspective of the tsunami was really driven by people's experiences of it um, and, and their film of it and, and the rest of it. Um, and uh, I, I, my visceral reaction, to be honest, is that actually it has not done as much to transform our experience and knowledge of um, uh, things like the conflict in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq as I might have thought it would. And, 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 and I think the logical reason for that is obviously the military and, and you know, reasonably tight, tight clamps on it and the like. Having said that, I do think you really have seen a pretty profound shift um, in, in our experience of other geopolitical events. Um, and, and I think you know, the, the quintessential case would probably be Egypt, right? So the square. I mean, so that was really something that it was not just that Twitter was really important there. I mean, well, there's a whole debate about whether or not it was or not. But I think that actually um, the, the experience of that was, was really mediated in a lot of ways through social media. And I think it played a really profound role in, in the way we experienced it and in some degree the way we understood it. And I think it also probably played a profound role in the success of it. Um, I mean, now we don't know if it succeeded, but the success at the time um, in the sense that I think it um, you know, made it clear how much more difficult it is actually for um, authoritarian regimes, at least of a certain stripe, to, um, to, to, to control the media. And I think that that actually has been, has been quite galvanizing. Another example would be Syria. I mean, Syria is, is kind of a, a complicated example because I think in the United States it probably has not had the same effect that it has in other parts of the world. Um, but if you want, if you're interested, it obviously throws an enormous amount of information out there um, that is getting to us in a way that would not have gotten to us from past civil wars. Um, and and it's, um, you know, some of it is incredibly explicit, some of it is very hard to watch, but a lot of it is, is I think, um, in well, informative in a way that, that, that you know, we probably have not seen in, in, previous, in previous conflicts. And I think that has made it harder um, for authoritarian rulers to, well, I don't know, it's harder, but they probably don't really care one way or the other. So um, it's, it's sort of a challenge in that regard. The other thing we've seen, and uh, we did a piece, oh, maybe we didn't, no, I think we did a piece, about um, this guy in, uh, in England who has become this incredibly, uh, who's become basically the go-to source. He's just a random guy who has become an expert in, or is an expert in uh, weaponry. And he has become the go-to guy for um, trying to understand whether or not the Syrian regime is using chemical weapons, what kind of weapons they were using, where were they, where were the rebels, where have the rebels been getting weapons from and the like. And, and the reason he's able to do that is because of all this footage that's basically being uploaded by, um, in some cases by the rebels, in some cases by the Assad regime, um, and in some cases just by journalists who are there. And the fact that all this raw footage is really coming out, um, I think is really, again, and that's a pretty concrete example, really changing um, the experience um, both of, of consumers of information but also of journalists as well. I mean, it, it, change, it raises the bar, it changes it in that regard. And, and so, you know, the other thing I would say, and this is sort of off your topic, but I think is connected, is you've also seen this really in the financial world. So I think one of the biggest changes um, in, in the business and finance world in the last, let's say, 10, or 10 years, not 10 years, five years, six years, um, is really the role that bloggers play um, in the finance world. And that the, the kind of in-depth analysis you now see, um, not just of financial documents, but also of during the housing, bu during the housing um, uh, bust, uh, of you know what was going on there, that that has really again kind of changed. I think uh, the way people are, are not just the way people are getting information, but really the kind of information people are getting. I think the bar again has kind of really been raised in that regard. So, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, James. I think you'd agree that words matter. Yeah. And and word choice is really important. So I was thinking about the title of your book, and I couldn't help but wonder about the word wisdom. It's kind of an old-fashioned word. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't use intelligence or, or even, you know, a half dozen other words, cleverness, what have you, maybe yeah. not that one. 
So did you make that choice? Yeah. Did your editor make your choice? No, I made it. Why I did made you it. choose wisdom? Um, I made it, and um, I think, uh, I don't know that I have a great answer to you in the sense that I think part of it is just that um, it sounded right to me, that the, um, I haven't actually thought that deeply about, about that particular aspect of it, but, but when I think about it now, um, it, as a phrase, I think the beats of it are really nice. Um, and I think there's something euphonious about it. And I think that that, 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 that sort of matters. Um, but the, the concept behind it, though, was really, it was explicitly intended, and maybe this is why it sounds, why um, a slightly, not, it's not archaic, but a slightly old-fashioned word made sense, was it was really intended as a kind of uh, take on or take off on. Um, Charles Mackay's book, Extraordin the, the uh, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. So it was really intended as a sort of repose to that. And in that sense, it probably made sense to have a two-syllable word like madness. It made sense to, madness is kind of an old-fashioned word, word as well. And it sort of made, I mean, he was writing in the 19th century, so of course he was old-fashioned, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I think it sort of made sense. And, and, and the, the truth is also that I was, I suppose, and am, trying to say something about um, the kind of accuracy of this, of, of what crowds can come up with, that, that actually they really are uncovering truth in, in, some, in, some, in many circumstances. And that I, maybe there aren't as many words out there that really convey that the way, the way wisdom does. Now, you know, when you pick a title like that, of course it does, because you know, there are plenty of people who are like, wisdom is blah, blah, you know, whatever, some other. Uh, but, but, you know, I, but thinking about it, I do think also part of it is just like the solidity of it, the, of the sound of it, um, kind of conveys what I was trying to, to, to really say. So, yeah, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, first uh, comment and then a question. Sure. Uh, having lived in Brooklyn uh, two decades back, I agree with you. Uh, the wisdom was just to make sure that you got to the car just before the minute the parking attendant was there right there. <laughs> That's, right. The That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. The question is, uh, while I think many of us extol the virtues of uh, uh, wisdom of crowds, but uh, it looks, appears like... Uh, the leaders are extolling the uh, virtues, the wisdom of the lobbyist and special interest. Uh, and uh, by that way, it doesn't seem to be that the masses are getting uh, their say there. Can you comment on that? Yeah, um, I wish I had a good sort of solution to that problem. I mean, I, I think that actually speaks again to the, to the first question about democracy and, and to why uh, democracy, the, or the democracy we have, um, is, is an imperfect, at best, representation of the wisdom of crowds. Because I, I think that that's, you know, that's a huge issue. And, and some of it is, I think, inherent in representative democracy. So that um, instead of choosing the com trying to represent the common good or, or search for the common good, instead it's you know, what's best for my state or what's best for the local industry or whatever it is. And, and so I think that, that, that there's, there's that issue. But then beyond that, there's also what's best for the lobbyists who are lining my pockets, who are et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's become especially difficult, obviously, um, in the sense that um, money plays a bigger role in politics than ever before. It's obviously harder now because of Citizens United and assorted other decisions to, um, to get money out of politics. It wouldn't be surprising, I think, if, if this court overturned the, you know, the limits on campaign contributions entirely. That certainly seems like a po well, it's a possibility, at least. Um, and, and so in that regard, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. I mean, I, I do think, you know, the hope is um, that this is a place where information transparency can, can create, benef uh, create benefits, that um, the tools are certainly there to make all this stuff public. Um, one of the ironies is that it's not always clear that making things public necessarily gets people to stop doing them. Um, that's why there are actually political scientists who say that the real key is instead of making co campaign contributions transparent, force them to be anonymous. So you can donate as much money as you want, but no one can know that you did it, basically. Because the thinking there is, well, then no one will owe anybody, basically, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a really difficult question. I mean, I, I'll give you a exam simple example from right now, which is in New Jersey, yesterday or two days, two days ago, I guess, um, they, uh, the Christie administration sort of unilaterally, oh, they'll, they'll come up with some explanation for why it wasn't unilateral, but 
unilaterally basically said that Tesla can't sell cars to consumers, that they have to go through the dealer, an established dealer network in order to do this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, uh, that's a decision that no consumer is in favor of. Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration, but almost no consumer. And in fact, whenever um, bills trying to actually do this like, uh, have come up, they generally get voted down because they're so clearly unpopular with consumers. But what we know, and this is only the most recent example of this, is that car dealers are incredibly powerful. The car dealer lobby is amazingly powerful on a state level. Um, because you know, car dealers are a, a big constituency in terms of, of dollars. They employ a lot of people oftentimes. they um, oftentimes quite lucrative, so they have, they have a lot of lobbying power. And so you know, it's the reason why we can't buy cars direct off the internet. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's why when um, you know, car companies want to shut down uh, uh, imprints, uh, imprints, when they want to shut down uh, like you know, Oldsmobile, which is when GM do it, they had to pay huge sums of money to car dealers to, to actually get to do that. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think, a real classic case where the wisdom, of crowd, the wisdom of crowd actually is pretty clear in this case. The crowd really wants one thing. I think they're right to want it. Um, and they're just not getting it. And I think it's, I don't know, I think it's a huge problem because I think it also contributes to general disillusionment with democracy. So maybe one more? One more. Okay, yeah, great. Well, this kind of fits in. Maybe it's repetitive. I don't know. But uh, in everything you've explained, it seems that the wisdom of crowds is very dependent upon the wisdom of uh, the selection of the participants in the crowd and then the questions that are asked of that particular group. Do you see any system, I mean, in society other than uh, the profit motive, which is our primary uh, motivating factor in, in this country, it seems, uh, do you see any other system that might allow us to benefit more greatly from the wisdom of crowds? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I would actually say the second, in a strange way, is probably more important. So while I, I think selecting the participants is, is, um, is important, and that was sort of what I was sort of alluding to with democracy, I actually think in a lot of cases that casting a pretty wide, as a wide net um, is, is probably going to get you a good answer, a reasonably good answer. I think that the real challenge when it comes to selecting oftentimes actually is when the group is smaller. So one of the funny things about the wisdom of crowds is you can actually see its effects at work even in groups as small as like six or eight people. Um, but the challenge is with groups that are that small, you need to work harder to ensure that they're diverse. Um, because, and also to be independent of each other, but that has more to do with operations in terms of selection. Um, because obviously in smaller groups, you know, a few people who are really homogeneous can kind of throw off the whole thing. Where with larger crowds, you're just more likely to get diversity almost by, um, just by math, essentially. Um, it's more complicated than that, but I think that actually the, the second part of it is really interesting, which is asking the right kinds of questions. And I don't think I have, there's a, a simple recipe for it. I actually think that, that the way I kind of imagine the process operating best is when the crowd generates questions in a sense, um, you know, via whatever mechanisms you, you use to, um, and then, uh, so individuals in the crowd are just coming up with ideas or to, about what, what, what makes sense. Um, and then um, uh, leaders can sort of, you know, filter them way in on, with their own judgments about what makes sense. But then, uh, then really the key part is letting the crowd sort of decide which of these are the right questions to ask, in a sense, I think. Um, and and uh, there are a lot of mechanisms to do this, uh, you know, um, that I think governments can use, I think community organizations can use, and the like. Um, I, I, I talk about them in my book, you know, you can use these prediction markets, which actually don't involve, you don't have, there doesn't have to be any real money at stake. What they really just get you to do is kind of, um, the, the key is, is that what you want people to do is, you want people to have some incentive to be right. So you want people to have some incentive to actually think hard about the question. Um, and you also want people, uh, it, I guess in a sense what you're trying to do is, is um, derive as much, um, you, you want people to actually think hard about the knowledge they have, but you also want them to represent it in a way that lets you aggregate it. So that sounds kind of, that's, jar, that's perfect jargon right there, actually. What you want is you want, um, 
what you're looking for, I think, is more than just a kind of suggestion box model. So I actually am really prone to liking systems where you actually ask people um, not just what should we do, but also you know, how successful do you think this would be at whatever the, the goal you're trying to achieve is. Um, and, and, and actually asking people to sort of quantify it in some way, to say, I think there's a 70% chance that this will work or whatever it is. Now, there's something artificial about that, right? You don't really know, do I think it's a 65% chance or a 72% chance? But I think in actually getting people to quantify it, in a sense, what you help them do is kind of drill down to, to the kind of granular level. And, and I think that it actually allows people to, um, to think about their choices in, in a better way. The other thing you can do is actually give people uh, a kind of portfolio of, 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 of assets or just, I don't know, the simplest way to do it is say you have 20 chips. Here are four options. How would you distribute the chips across those options? Um, and, and so what that really asks you to do is sort of, and this is one of the problems that we sometimes have with participatory democracy as, as, as expressed in referendums, for instance, is that one of the, you know, we know California is famously a, me a mess, right, or was a mess for at least a while, because part, in part because they rely on referendums all the time. Well, one of the big problems with referendums is a referendum just asks you yes or no. It doesn't ask you to make any decision about what should you give up in order to get this yes, or you know, what, what kind of choices or trade-offs are you willing to make. Um, and so that's why you end up with, you know, you have crowds that simultaneously want Prop 13 and also want education spending to rise. And it's like, well, well no. But uh, so the 20, the 20 chip example, just to give you a simple one, what that does is it actually forces you to kind of say, how would you allocate your resources among these? And it also implicitly says, which do you think of these is most important or, or which do you think is most likely to succeed? And I think that there are all these kinds of tools you can do to do, use to do this. I will say also, the other thing I would say is, is when I think about leaders, I actually think if you have people who can ask really good questions, that that actually probably is the most valuable thing a leader can do. That actually someone who can really diagnose what the key questions, strategic questions or ethical questions, whatever they are, um, someone who can do that is actually really um, what you want a leader to be. And actually, that echoes Peter Drucker, the sort of probably most famous management theorist in history, actually said the leader of the 20th century was um, someone who was, expe was expected to come up with answers. The leader of the 21st century, um, it, or it may have been the leader of the future, is going to be someone who uh, knows how to ask the right questions. And I think that that is something that's a skill that's really profound and not one that necessarily everyone is good at. So, so all right, thank you very much. Thanks. That was great. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks.